Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief. We are really getting down to it. 2023 is almost over in terms of World Cups. Uh, we're coming at you after the actually really impressive Copa Lead World Cup. I uh, just wrapped up a couple days ago. Honestly, my expectations after World Championships were that the World Cups were going to be a snooze and the attendance lists were really going to shrink up and not be that impressive, but I had a great time watching. I think these guys did too. I'm Tyler Norton, joined as always by my co-host John Bergman, who writes the uh, post-comp debriefs for Climbing Magazine and of course is the author of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing. And we're joined this week by one of the best-traveled photojournalists in climbing. It is Vladik Zumer joining us from Zurich, Switzerland. Of course, plenty of experience, not just as a photojournalist, but also as a climbing coach and just being in the competitive climbing industry. And of course, co-host of Climbing Intelligence Agency, uh, a podcast which you can find on YouTube, linked down below, as well as on probably a bunch of other uh, podcast apps like Spotify, so you can find it there. Spotify, yep. Yeah, interviews with coaches and some of the best athletes in the world, like Jakob Schubert, Natalia Grossman, Oriane Bertone, Colin Duffy. They're getting all of them. So if you're not watching that stuff, make sure you check the link below after this episode is done. All right. So those are the introductions. Uh, and as is tradition, the guest has to go first and introduce what the the big headline from the comp was. So Vladik, I'm handing it over to you. What was your biggest takeaway from this weekend? Yeah, I was uh, shortly thinking about it in um, in the airplane, and then I thought the headline for me it's for sure the uh, Yanya is back on the top. So after the world champs and last year, yeah, that's the that's the thing. I think she <laughs> it was it was amazing that she won like home World Cup, you know, uh, after not winning the world championships and be under the pressure and all the stuff yeah it was for sure my headline and uh, highlight sorry i feel like being there in person it made it much harder to choose anything else because of course the whole crowd and like everybody there the yeah. whole story for everyone must have been yanya 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 the entire weekend right tell me tell for me sure. just like what that energy was from like i'm sure even in qualifiers there must have been crowds and hype and all that stuff what was the what was the energy it was it was great. It's a great venue on the uh, Lucas Gym, and apparently there was less people than last year because last year was like I don't know like eight thousand people, eight thousand spectators there. This year they are they have been selling the tickets, so uh, the amount of the spectators decreased, but the atmosphere was like amazing. It was cheering from from the qualifiers. To the finals just yeah it was all about Jania and Slo not just Jania all the Slovenians actually mm -hmm. so it was great and I had um, I had actually time to uh, spend with Jania and Roman a few days before the competition so we have been yeah for a dinner and then we went to the gym when she's training so I could see you know it's crazy circuits on the spray wall and yeah it was really impressive to which <laughs> to, uh, to which see. gym was that that you were climbing at was it at plus or or where uh, no 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 it's a small gym where just uh yania trains with uh or roman train with his athletes right. so i always it's probably, forget so it's a i always forget huge... what the name is but yeah yeah um yeah I that's okay that's uh, okay it's all good. it's all good we'll, we'll put it, it well, yeah. we'll, we'll add it in post that's that's all good um uh there, I, I had a question did you get to hear anything at all about if um if they were happy with the number of tickets they sold because from the stream the crowd looked excellent like it was a it was a great crowd and maybe mm -hmm. it could have you know it wasn't like chamonix level of of you know just bodies all the way to the horizon, but it was still a huge crowd and, and very animated. So I imagine if it was free last year, but they they had like ticket sales this year around, it was probably actually a pretty good break for the organizer. Like it seemed like yeah. a good crowd. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it was, I don't know. I don't know actually how many people have, they have been there because they didn't say any number or I didn't get it. But uh, yeah shouting was real loud so <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great yeah john um like for, from your side i and we'll talk about serato later but i think that was kind of yeah. a, a question for me was okay this was a, a really big day for Anraku serato as well 
But there's something about the energy, maybe it was because it was in Slovenia, just something about this comp says, no, the focus has to be on on Yanya Garnbret. And and you may want to pair them up. You may want to say it's Yanya and I, that, that's really what the package deal is. But John, like, it, did you fall on the same side where the the main story was Yanya or did you lean more towards Serato? I think you have to give it to Yanya because <laughs> she was not only the, the superstar in terms of winning in exciting and epic fashion but also because she was the superstar in terms of crowd reaction in terms of i mean she she's just she's like the the local hero and it was really evident in the way the crowd was chanting seemingly non-stop her entire climb i think i said in my recap i've never heard a crowd chant like so constantly during anybody's attempt so that was wonderful to see but to your point yeah i i mean at this point the end of the two, 2023 season or getting near the end of it, you cannot talk about Yanya Garnbrett seemingly without talking about Imori, at least in a lead context, because that is the most, I think, the most intriguing rivalry in comp climbing right now is is between the two of them. And what, what was interesting is just go back, a, what, a couple weeks, the World Championships, and it was like we were we as the fan base and the media and all that, we were just starting to get in agreement that, okay, Yanya is, is clearly the better boulderer. And I think there are, uh, you know, a number of people that are better than I, Maury, at bouldering as well, even beneath Yanya, like Natalia Gross, sure. Brooke Rabbit, too, all that. Y- Yanya is the better boulder. But when it comes to the lead discipline, I think we were all kind of starting to think like, yeah, I, I think I has has got the edge. I think I, at this point, 2023, is the better lead climber than Yanya Garnbrett. And it's rare that there's agreement like that in comp fandom, but I think there there was. And yet, as soon as we start to shake hands on that, Yanya Garnbrett says, not so fast, right? <laughs> and she ends up beating Imori in a pretty decisive fashion. It wasn't like the World Championships where Imori beat Yanya, but remember, they, they both... I think they both got to the top, right? And so it was count back. There wasn't any of that, at least in the final round here. This was Yanya Garnbrett clearly on this day in this round being the better lead climber between the two of them. And it just goes back to what we always say that Yanya has this uncanny ability to always impress, right? It's like she's been injured for a while. You think she's going to come back and probably struggle, maybe not be the same. Oh, very quickly, she's back to the, the same great Yanya. Here, she's going up against I. We think, okay, but I will probably have have the edge, probably maybe get the win. Nope. Yanya still manages to get that out. Yeah, she just You know what's Yanya... what's so telling about how how tight these two climbers have been over the last like year, basically, is that you refer to it as a decisive win when Yanya won by two moves in the final, and the only other round where they didn't tie, Yanya beat her by like one move, I think, in in one of the qualifying routes. And that's what we consider like decisive, right? Because it didn't come down to some tie break mechanic or something. And I think that's like that's that's it's I haven't been this excited about women's lead climbing since that Cheyenne So era where all of a sudden we had all those like fresh, like literally brand new 15 year old faces immediately after Yanya Garnbread is crowned like the best. Like, you know, everybody's talking about greatest of all time because she sweeps the boulder season in 2019 and then Cheyenne comes up. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it it's actually really compelling to watch those two climbers go head to head. Quick little note to talk about how satisfying a competition this was. This was the first competition in a long time. I don't remember the last time it happened, but it's one of those rare competitions where in both the men's and the women's there was only one top in the final for each gender and on top of that it was the final climber out which is kind of like you know the classic baseball thing exactly bottom of the ninth bases loaded you know whatever two strikes or outs or whatever it is you know it was that perfect opportunity to set up the entire event to this like this climactic finish and it was it was beautiful so yeah Um, and on top of that too the the added narrative is that it is Yanya winning in her home country, right? Which we've seen before is not a given. Uh, no. In fact, like several other competitors that we could name, she she's had her struggles when it's her own country hosting the event, either because the other competitors are great or because there's nerves and anxiety. Who knows? Pressure. But uh, I think that just adds to it. It wasn't just that Yanya gets the only top in the in the final round. It wasn't just that it, it came at the very end of the final round. It was that she is the hometown, home country hero winning. That's kind of like the perfect storybook ending to any competition. 
Vladik, I want to ask you a little bit about, um, you know, the way we've seen Yanya present herself uh, online, on the stream, in social media. It feels like in the last couple of years has changed a little bit. And I think the way it looks to me is like she is coming to accept who she is and who the world thinks of her as, which is this this gilded champion just draped in gold medals. And it, it almost seems like she has discovered her way of making peace with that reality and importantly making peace with how much pressure is on her wherever she goes. Um, I'm curious as somebody that is frank, usually at more competitions than you miss, <laughs> it seems like, um, for your, from yourself as, as a nearer observer, um, do you feel like she's becoming a little bit better at handling some of the pressure that has started to really uh, pile onto her since like 2019 when she started getting this like unbeatable uh, um, uh, reputation? Do you think she's handling that better and, and starting to thrive mm -hmm. in that? I think so. She she still feels that pressure because, or I'm sure she she feels pressure like uh, like now in, in Copra, you know, in the home World Cup, it's extreme pressure because everyone expects her to win. I expect her to win and I know it's not given, but still I expect Yanya to win. But uh, she can handle that Better. I know she <laughs> um, around the Olympics. She was like, um, I think she did like big, big uh, mental preparation for it because of this, like really like long time special uh, coaching, mental coaching. Because like physically she was prepared, but yeah, because of the pressure and you know the media and stuff, so she has to do some special preparation for it. But yeah, I think now she was. Um, like especially in copper, she was kind of. I I haven't seen the so much pressure. Like you know, she doesn't didn't show it so much. Maybe in the semifinals a bit, but in the final route, it was yeah, just perfect climbing and yeah. I think she can deal she can deal with it much better now for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, let's let's talk about Imori a little bit because they they're they now are are connected almost it's it's one of the other and it seems like we won't see Yanya in Bujang and I I haven't checked the registration list maybe we won't see Imori either um Imori also exceptional climbing all weekend and again we can only separate the two by I think a total of three three movements in the entire competition so it's awfully tight um but I'm curious if if after this competition, I'll start with Vladik and then go to John. Does your um, does your your impression of who Imori is as a climber? Because again, we've we haven't seen Imori climb all that much in the mm -hmm. last couple of years. We only started to see her again exactly a year ago, almost when she uh, came back onto the circuit in Koper 2022. And since then, her attendance has been you know only here and there. Koper, uh, Edinburgh. And then just two or three competitions this year. Um, do you feel like this competition, or just the 2023 in general, has given you a good idea of who Imori is and what she can do and what she can't, or is she still a bit of an unknown uh, for you when you're watching her? For me, it's, she's kind of unknown. But what I realized, or what I think, she she's just kind of special in the way that. She just care about the topping the route, you know, like if you remember the world champs, she get a ticket to Paris and her answer was, ah, oh, I didn't top the route. <laughs> so she somehow, you know, her goal, it's like top the route and that's it. So she lived just for it, for this somehow. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's kind of special. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. John, what about you? I think we know what we're going to get from Imori generally, meaning we know her strengths, which is just being to it's somewhat like Jesse Grouper ish, or maybe Jesse is somewhat Imori ish in that, you know, you think, gosh, they're going to fall off at some point. Like just, just the, the, the stickiness of the, the ability to just keep going, to keep grinding up farther and farther up the route when you think that. They have to. They have to be spent by now. I, 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 Mori just has this uncanny ability to stay on the wall, except when there's dynamic movement. And I know we sound kind of like a broken record, but that is that has been her kryptonite in the past. I think it's still her weakness. I don't know if that is going to change anytime soon. But the exciting thing, I guess, is that she, she, her participation at these comps 
does tend to be fairly intermittent. And so since there there are these long periods where we don't see her, she could be certainly doing dynamic movement training, coordination training in that interim where we don't see her. And one of these comps, she could come back and all of a sudden be surprisingly proficient at dynamic movement. I think that's perfectly possible. Will it happen? I don't know. But we're going to get these long gaps seemingly next year too because they said that she's going to go to university and probably won't be doing a lot of World Cups in 2024. So we're going to have these question marks again, I guess, every time she shows up, which is going to be like, what's her fitness like? What's her coordination ability like? Has she improved a lot? Uh, remaining X factors with I, Mori, I think next year will probably presumably be just like it was this year with some of that mystery. I, Vladik, I don't know your coaching resume. I have also done some climbing coaching, but if somebody asked me for advice about coaching an Olympian, I would be so, so far removed from my expertise. But I, I want to ask you just from, from your climbing experience, if, uh, if, if you were put on the spot and, and asked to give your opinion on what Imori needs to focus on in the next year heading towards the Olympics, is there anything in particular where you would say, you are missing these skills. You are missing this this mindset. What what is it that you think she needs to do to, you know, get mm -hmm. that gold in uh, Paris? I think mindset is not a problem by Aymore. She's her mindset is kind of like straight, you know, going for the top. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, I agree with the John. Like those dynamic movements that she should work on for sure. And um, I think that's maybe it's gaining a bit more uh, muscles to be able to do those movements that could be the, the thing you know like yeah because you need you need some muscle to to do the dynamics move so you need bigger so. let, let me ask a question that's kind of related to that which is what i something that i was just saying which was that they've said that i mori is not going to be doing a lot of World Cups next year be because of school. Mm -hmm. And I guess, how do you both feel about that? How do you both feel about her decision? Uh, she She's this otherworldly talent and her decision to, instead of uh, sort of focusing 100% on taking that talent wherever it can take her and her decision to, to kind of compartmentalize that talent in the participation in World Cups and and go to school full time from the sound of it. What do you think about that? Didn't didn't Brooke take a semester off or, or a year off when Brooke got the Olympic uh, invitation? Like she put school on pause, right? I I'm think she sure. did. I don't I know if we knew that. about that at the time. I Maybe think that not. that's something yeah. that's kind of been publicized after the fact. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that the hard part for me is I'm so biased. Like to me, I want all of these climbers to not do anything <laughs> else, but just get really good at climbing. Like not just for the Olympics. I want them to put everything else on hold and just be really good climbers so I can have fun watching them. And obviously I know that that's madly unrealistic. And for most climbers on the circuit, there's very little to gain from from just spending your time training and climbing. There's It's more fruitful to pursue probably other avenues for a lot of climbers. But to me, Imori's right at the top. And, and I say, you know, she's, in my opinion, only a few degrees away from being an Olympic favorite. It's really just kind of like you were talking about, she gets betrayed by power and dynamism, which ruins her on, you know, only one or two moves per lead route, but on the bouldering half of things, so long as we're in the combined discipline, it's it's going to be a huge weakness mm -hmm. the whole time there. So I don't really know what to think. I don't know what, like, I'm Maury seems like she's probably a, a just a very diligent person. And it's, you know, the, the one question for me is we were missing her for a couple of years during COVID. That could be for a bunch of reasons, but... I think it is still hard to to train your best if you've also got these new challenges and a new lifestyle and stuff. Who knows how she's going to balance that? Maybe she could pull it off, but I certainly am a little nervous because I just want to see like the best climbers be at their best by the time we get to next August, right? So we'll see what she can do. But may maybe on the other side, you know, like if she do just school and she can train during that period and not travel for the World Cup, so she had time to tr really train, so... You know, that's true. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point, Vladik. I actually didn't really think about the, the 
travel, the grind, the jet lag, and you as well as anybody knows what that can take out of people mm-hmm. just because you travel so much for the World Cups. I I guess I was tending to think along the lines of Tyler, which is I I I, I don't know. I mean, if I was advising her, I suppose, not knowing anything about her 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 life, her interests in academia and all that, I would really think like, yeah, you might want to consider Look, I'm not saying don't go to school. I think that's great, but you but but school can can wait. You could defer a year or two years or three years and then go to school when you're still you know, you're still young, still she would be what 24, 25, 26. You could go to school then and focus fully on the competition climbing now because you are one of the best two in the world in the lead discipline. Uh and the window as you alluded to, Tyler, the window of peak performance in competition climbing. Uh, sure, you have people like Akio Noguchi who's, and Sean Akoxi and, and, and Yanya and people that stay on top for a long time, a long, robust career. Sean McCall, certainly. But that's not the norm, right? Usually, people are lucky if they have one or two peak seasons performatively. And it seems like I, Mori is right in that peak. So I would... I would strongly advise her, like, yeah, you might want to just focus on this because once this performative peak is over, there's plenty of other time to go to school and and you haven't really lost that much in terms of years and whatnot. But, uh, of course, it's, like I said, I don't know her. It's her choice entirely, and school's important. But we're not saying just drop out for good. We're saying maybe just defer it for a year or two and see how far you can take this because you are an Olympic favorite in at least one of the portions of the combined John, John, are you, are you, this is such a weird dive, like tangent all of a sudden. John, are you a Fulbright scholar, by the way? Yeah. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So John is, John is like the ultimate, in my opinion, like that is just a huge name in academics. So John, John is somebody who has loved the school life. I, on the other hand, dropped out of school for jazz trombone playing. So I can go the other way. Y'all can skip school as much as you want. That education hasn't served me well at all. Um, But hey, if John is saying, you know, maybe take a break, maybe, you know, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. You can always come back, get, get those big scholarships like, uh, like John did. But yeah. Um, where do I want to take this? Is there anything else uh, else we want to take uh, talk about uh, Yanya and I? Maybe talking about the climbs in particular, or maybe we should just comment briefly on the other women. Just on the Slovenia tangent, um, Vita Lukin looks like the kind of person who has recently won a gold medal. She looks like a confident climber, and uh, it's. I imagine she thinks she could have got a bit farther with uh, drier hands, um, <laughs> but that was a killer climb, man. What a great like a uh, you know, I, Mia Krampel, of course takes the worst possible prize. The joke in the Plastic Weekly world is that there is always somebody on the Slovenian team who has to have an embarrassingly low fall. The low Slovenian fall, as we call it, it just always happens. There's always somebody that has to fall too low. Um, so she got the short straw this time. But yeah, Vita was was like such an excellent appetizer heading into Yanya's performance. Um, did did you notice it at the time, Vladik? That's one of those things where I imagine if your eyes down the lens, you, you might not actually catch somebody's chalk bag drop off so, uh, yeah i realized that for sure yeah. <laughs> i did i did yeah i was like okay it's that slovenian thing to losing chore backs yeah yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah i was joking with the coaches uh the funny is uh i i had a coffee like two days before the um, uh competition with uh, vita and her hometown mm-hmm. and she said yeah she's not like in good shape so she doesn't expect so much from the competition and here we are so of course yeah, <laughs> yeah it was do we, really good yeah. do, do we know why did she forget to clip her chalk bag or did it look like maybe there was a chance that her clip like when she was clipping at one point it maybe like brushed a a, a carabiner and it somehow like came unclipped that'd be very unlikely but do we know what the reason for the chalk bag coming unbuckled was i don't i haven't asked her but no but mm. i could do it later yeah <laughs> Would be interesting. I never would have guessed. I don't think any of uh, any of us would have guessed that a chalkless Vita Lucan would outclimb a chalked up Cheon So. Right. That for me <laughs> sure. was the most su- surprising. One of the most surprising outcomes. Uh, and we we could talk more about Cheon So. I think Cheon said on her Instagram that this was the first time without a medal uh i'm assuming she's meaning just i mean obviously just in the lead 
discipline. Um, and I didn't fact check that, but, uh, yeah, kind of a kind of a surprisingly low fall for Cheyenne. Still not a bad performance at all. But um, I don't know whether it was like a, a surprising misstep from Cheyenne or just a, 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 an extra particularly good climb from Vita. I don't know if it's if it's A or B. But yeah, I was very surprised that Vita ends up without chalk, out climbing Cheyenne So and a number of other people. Both bronze medalists were crazy surprises, man. Like, yeah. I mean, Alberto's like, well, we, we should switch over to talk about Serato. But I mean, both Alberto and Vita, if, you know, based off just, you know, early predictions, although Alberto, great for anyway. OK, we'll come back to Alberto. I don't want to get distracted because <laughs> I'm, of course, a huge Alberto fan. And finally, I can talk about him because he's been missing for like two years. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the other massive story which of course is Serato and Raku getting the win and not just for this particular World Cup stop but for the 2023 uh, lead World Cup overall winning the season and becoming the first person I I'm going to debate this but the first person to win both the Boulder World Cup and the lead World Cup together in one season my debate is just because in 1998 Liv Sansos like won the Top Rock Challenge which was just the like the prequel year to the Boulder World Cup but like all the best climbers were at those comps right like everybody was at those Top Rock Challenges and she won like three out of the five and came second in the other and then of course she won the Lead World Cup that year in 98 as well so in my opinion that was pretty legit also, even though it wasn't called the World <laughs> Cup just yet. And I guess, you know, skipping over completely the fact that his climb was awesome. I think that the topic for me that's resonating is like, we've spent this entire year not really giving a shit about the overall World Cup and athletes admitting that, no, you know, the goal is is the Olympics. And Jakob Schubert, of course, saying the same thing, but also lamenting the loss of the overall as a as a, a key factor in the interview that uh, that he did with uh, Vladek and, and Bjorn, a climbing intelligence agency. Um, so congrats to him on an incredible achievement. But like, does anybody care? That's the one thing is like, if if one of the teams all of a sudden was like, wow, this is the biggest possible thing after not mentioning the overall World Cup for like a couple of years, I would have been calling them out on just like complete hypocrisy. But I, yeah, I just kind of curious what you guys think about this. Like it is, it is something special because it's almost never been done before, depending on how you feel about the 1998 bouldering circuit. Um, but does it like does it mean anything at this point? Is it just a little bit of trivia, or is it actually something special? I don't know. I think for for the climbers, like for me, it uh, mean a lot because winning the overall, it's always like, yeah, overall, it's overall. But it doesn't have this meaning probably in the brighter uh, publicum because it's all about the uh, Olympics and World Championships, which is yeah, which is really pity. That's I completely agree with uh, with the Jakob. So they should bring the importance of the uh, World Cup back again. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, John. I guess the short answer is to answer your question. N no, nobody cares. And I I think I mean the the asterisk there is I mean I care. We care, of course. Like I think it's a huge deal. <laughs> and I think the climbers, to Vladik's point, the climbers care. But when I say nobody cares, I mean the, the fan base at large, the casual viewers, it doesn't really mean much to them. And I think it's unfortunate. I wish it did. But I think there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, at a literal level, the, the overall season title is an accumulation of many, many points. And that is not nearly as exciting to follow as the result of a single event, right? Like people want to watch results and see winners and losers. They don't want to just be tracking this like thousands of numbers stacking up throughout a season. That's just uh, on like a, a level of fandom that's not as exciting. Uh, I think also there are so many accolades already and accolades that are more important to the casual fan. Like, first of all, winning a world championship. I think to most people... That means more. That, that's a bigger deal. I won a world championship or I won the season, the overall season title. I think winning a world championship means more. Also, qualifying for an Olympics nowadays means, I think, more to the casual fan. And to, 
to that point, winning an Olympic medal means more. So already there, off the top of my head, those are three accolades, and you could probably put more on there, like a speed world record or something. Like, there's already so many accomplishments that that are greater in the eyes of fans than winning the overall season title. So what are you talking about now? Winning a overall season title is like the fifth or sixth most important accolade in the eyes of casual fans. Well, that's, you know, you can't expect people to, to have the same enthusiasm for number five or number six or number seven accolade on the list as they do as the first or second accolade on the list. Um, I, I, and I think one of the big issues that's hampering the overall is that it, it doesn't have a, a climactic structure, right? It's not like, okay, at this event, you know, whoever wins, we're going to determine who wins the season overall. No, it's like, sometimes it's decided way before the last event. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's decided on the last event. Sometimes it's decided at different events for the men and the women. Sometimes it's narrow. Sometimes it's a big gap between first and second. So I think that that is problematic too, because since there isn't that climactic structure, you don't really have any way to like hype it up and build it up. Right. The, the IFSC doesn't build like hype videos for like, who's going to win the overall season title this year. They don't do that because a lot of times it's going to be decided just, at weird points along the way. So it's funny. Cause last year, the men's title, I think came down to the final round of was Jakarta, the last lead world cup or was it Edinburgh? I can't, but anyway, it came down right to the end between Luca and Jesse and, and Ty say, like it came down to the last comp. And of course this year it's, different whereas the winner we've already declared it with one comp to go and i think the like you mentioned the other tough part is our final competition where that podium is technically going to be awarded and hopefully put on the live stream even though they've missed it a couple times in the past it doesn't even get broadcast um but it's going to be in in a, a really bad time zone in china at a competition where i will not be surprised if one or two of the spots on the overall podium the athlete isn't actually there right and that's pretty devastating like that women's podium might be pretty empty based on uh, uh, based on who does well in, in Wujang. But like Yanni Garnbrett's almost guaranteed a spot on the podium, I'm pretty sure. And she's not going to be there. So so there's one awkward photo for all you photographers to try and take. How do you how do you deal? With, actually, that's a great question. Like, how, is there any value to a podium photo when somebody's actually not there? Like, does that kind of feel weird taking that picture? Like that's that's such a uh, just such an, a weird event to have to deal with. I th I think I don't re remember. Maybe it happens once. It probably like, doesn't happen very much for yeah. for World Cups. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, it would be. Yeah, it happens for sure. I don't remember when, but yeah, it's kind of strange. I think that was even like that was the women's mm -hmm. uh, podium, and there was some coach, you know, some yeah, male coach yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> get the medal. So yeah, it was kind of strange. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> bring out bring out the cardboard cutouts of the competitors <laughs> who aren't there exactly. and put them at No, I, I, rem I remember when I when I would coach, we would have this issue when I was coaching a youth youth team you know you'd have this issue where uh at the end of the competition the comp youth comps especially uh like regional ones in the united states are very yeah. long they're like all day because there's so many different climbs and competitors and age groups so a lot of times by the end of the day a lot of the people that made the podium aren't even there anymore just because they're you got, family, you got family kids driving to... like eight hours to these local comps man they got to drive back to freaking nebraska or wherever they came from so yeah they're not sticking around for the medal even yeah. if they want it you're just like okay we got we're, we got our ticket to regionals or whatever we're getting the fuck out of here yes, yeah totally it, yeah it happened all the time <laughs> that you'd say like okay the podium ceremony and this person won the gold medal and or the the, the i guess like the blue ribbon right, right ribbons yeah. usually uh, yeah. They're not there. So it's just like, okay, well, this person from their team can accept it on their behalf. And it yeah, lose a little. I mean, I understand why, but uh, yeah, definitely you lose that photo op. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I um, it's, it's interesting because I, I think among the non-casual fans, the people that have at least paid attention and now realize, okay, Serato won the bouldering world cup and the lead world cup in the same year. And because that's so special, I think now there's a lot of expectation on what he might do in the future. Right. And it's interesting because he across the season, he has a handful of wins. It's not like a, a ton of wins, but he's got enough wins and he's got enough consistent placings that he's done well, but it's, this isn't some extraordinary 
men's season, right? Now, it's not that far off from what we would say is a really good season for the best male climbers, because in men's climbing, you do not get a season sweep or anything close to it, right? Like that never happens, not even for the best of them. But I wanted to, to get both of your take now that he's, you know, achieved this accomplishment. Um, what do you take from this guy? Like for me, I guess the way I'll summarize my thoughts is just by looking at him, he is clearly an exceptionally talented climber. But I have thought that same thing about other climbers in the past. And often the the big lofty peaks that you expect for them don't always come to pass. Um, so I'm curious what you guys just think in your in your own minds after watching him climb, um, what you're kind of what you expect from him, what you think is like a fair, uh, a fair prediction is for, uh, for Serato in the future. Is he somebody that's just going to keep winning for years and years and years? You know, people are comparing him to like a Yanya kind of status where he's going to go on for a decade being a consistent winner. Like, do you think it's fair to already be expecting that from, from a 16 year old kid or what? Um, Vladik, I'll, I'll give it to you first. Yeah, I, I have big expectation. I can look from Serato. Hmm. I think he's really super talented. And like one funny thing, we have been in OSP with the uh, Meiji and with the Taisei, like in Saturday for the World Cup, uh, for the um, finals. And they said the Sorato, he, for example, never trained on spray wall. He never trained bouldering. He does, he trained just endurance. So they don't understand how he is winning. So his teammates, they don't understand how he's winning the boulder. World Cups, so mm -hmm. I think he is super talented climber. Yeah, and I expect uh, I expect him to perform well in next years. If yeah, if nothing strange happens, but I mm -hmm. think he could he could be he could grow up, get stronger, and yeah, big expectation, big expectation for me. I agree with Vladik. I think that we. I expect big things from Serato. I don't think we have any reason to believe that he won't continue being good. I think what I would do is maybe pump the brakes a little bit, just like like all of us probably are doing, which is like, he's a maybe at this point. We have no way of knowing. 50% chance that he continues being great, 50% chance that he burns out, gets injured. This is his peak. Who knows? And of course, nobody wants any of that to happen. We want him to continue being great. All indications are that he will We'll see. It's hard to judge after just one season, adult adult season for him. I, I One of the things that I'd like to see em emerging with Serato in the coming seasons isn't even really having anything to do with him in particular, but I'd like to see a consistent rival emerge. Because if you look at what really takes competitors... That are that are consistently good. What really takes them to the next level in ter in terms of superstardom is not just accomplishments, but it's like accomplishments buffered with a rival, right? You think back to like Giant Kim. It wasn't just that Giant Kim was winning all those medals. Is it was that there was that subplot with the Mina Markovic like going you know back and forth, and then Yanya Garnbret starts off. It uh, well, I, I, let's look back a couple seasons. It wasn't just that Yanya was incredible, which she was, but it was like all of a sudden you had Natalia Grossman kind of putting pressure on her, and so that added intrigue. And then in the present day, we have Yanya Garnbrett and this I Mori uh, kind of coupling. So the, the intrigue for me is kind of, will a guy emerge that can be that foil to Serato? And, and if so, who would that be? Because it you know, if it's somebody that's already on the circuit, somebody that's that we've already seen, maybe a Mejdi in the bouldering division. Who would it be in the lead division? I don't know. Maybe a Toby based Roberts. On, based like, off this year, I think people would just say Toby Roberts by default yeah. because you see these two young guys both coming up, kind of dealing with the same kind of like age based, you know issues of you know experience mm -hmm. whatever this that they're both talented young guys so yeah i i want to i want to swerve really quick the the three the three things that concern me about serato and i would say this about like any talented young climbers first of all is he's really young and i don't know how his body's going to change and i don't know how he's going to cope with that second i don't know if he's going to actually continue to just like enjoy climbing because again he's so young 
if his body changes, is he going to find it as easy as it always has been for him? We're talking about this kid as somebody who just seems to like have this natural talent, right? And I'm sure he works really hard, but what happens if he needs to put in this extra level of work to maintain his skill, then maybe it changes how much he actually enjoys climbing. Or when you're that young, maybe something else in life comes up that suddenly is more enjoyable to you than comp climbing. And the last factor which affects both of those is the amount of pressure that he is likely to be put under over the next year, right? There is one spot left for a male Japanese climber in the Olympics, and he is considered the favorite. I think he's the most likely one to earn it, but go to Asian championships and on any given day, yeah, 100% it's possible that Yoshiyuki gets it or somebody else gets it. So I think there's pressure for that. But assuming Serato does actually get the Olympic ticket, then you have a year of being possibly like in the top three men's favorites for the Olympic Games uh, from a country that has kind of put a lot of pressure on their athletes in the past to perform well. And I'm really curious how he's going to handle that and how that team is going to handle it. Um, Japan has had a lot of young stars, but over the last couple seasons in the highest pressure moments, it's been somewhat mature athletes who are already in their 20s, if not their late 20s, who have been the torchbearers for Japanese climbing. And all of a sudden we're putting a climber into that sphere that is a decade younger than those people and is only after his first season and what's it going to be like for him if he now has to be like the the face of Japanese climbing this storied you know unstoppable nation of of climbing and he has to be the guy carrying that um, I'm very curious there we know so many climbers that had incredible young debuts from Johanna Ernst to David Lama you know both in that same era and competition climbing came to an end for them real quick and they were both remarkably talented in their first seasons and for different reasons, they were both like, nope, you know what? After three, four, five years, I am out of here. And uh, so, yeah, it's possible it's that. Or it could be something like a Cheyenne So year, right? Where she starts out at the very top, gold after gold after gold after gold. And then she just becomes a, a consistent finalist. And maybe her peak was her debut season, right? That, that could be true, too. So I really don't know what to expect, but I know for sure just looking at him, he is like something incredible right now. And yeah. uh, I hope we get to see more of it because he looks like he is carefree. And you know what's interesting, too, is and Vladik, I'm sure you got to see a little bit of this, too. When when he was in the crux moves of the climb where the other athletes were struggling and you could see the teams were like fingers crossed and cheering for their athlete. Like, come on, come on, Yannick, come on, Alex. Like you can get through this crux. The camera would pan to the Japanese team in those moments. And every single one of them was laughing. And there, it was so obvious that they had unending faith in this kid's ability to just hold anything that they thought it was a joke. They're like, don't worry about it. This is the hardest move all season. <laughs> Whatever, man, this kid's incredible. And it was such a, a, such a cool statement of confidence from his team that it's like, don't worry about it. He's got it. Like he's topping this thing, even though everybody else fell in the bottom half of this climb, it's no problem. I thought that was such a refreshing contrast to the rest of the field. That was so cool. But yeah. Um, let me, uh, let me swerve to, uh, Jesse, let's start just talk about the men's field in general for this and that final climb. Um, Vladik for yourself, do you think that men's final was what all the guys expected from the ground? Cause that was some, some hard crux stuff, uh, in the middle, but it seemed like even the start of the route was frankly pretty pumpy based on how they were performing when they got to those, uh, those moves where they all fell. Yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> the, the results say, show, show that how, how hard was the route, right? So the, I think the Jesse was, uh, uh, the, I mean, the Alberto was just like two moves after the fourth place, mm -hmm. you know, guy. And then there was Jesse who was like 20 more moves yeah, and yeah. then Sarah <laughs> the top. So yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. incredible. Yeah, do you did you do you get the vibe that those those athletes actually uh, like still enjoy those climbs or or is that like less fun for them? Like it's you know they they see that their peers and the other competitors struggled the same way that they did, but certainly there's got to be some you know that they're let down a bit by it's hard all of a sudden and none of them got to get as high as they expected. Like do do the athletes seem to feel a bit different after a climb like that? 
Yeah, for sure, for sure. Because, you know, it depends on what kind of move is it. Sometimes, you know, they f fell off and they say they are like kind of angry because they couldn't like fight at all. You know, they couldn't fight with the root. They just, yeah, just fell off. And mm -hmm. they are after, after situation like that, they are like really, yeah, depri deprimated. And like, for example, in the semifinals, you know, in that 20 or 21, those screams, mm -hmm. where everyone, every Japanese was like shaking one hand there right. and they didn't do the next move. So, yeah, but all of them, they have been kind of down after that. Right. The Taisei, he was like, really, yeah, he, he didn't take it well. <laughs> yeah, interesting. So after the climbing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. John, what did you think about that men's, that men's final route? Well, I... I mean, let's talk about Jesse Grouper in particular. I uh, do you think he did he did he kind of need this performance to sort of stay relevant kind of this year to sort of put himself back in the conversation? It didn't feel that dire in terms of his season heading into it. But after he had such a great performance, I kind of came away and in, in hindsight, I was like, yeah, he kind of I mean, at least in my opinion, I, I think Jesse kind of needed this. Uh, because his yeah, season... it's a hard year, but also just like it kind of sucks to be a lead specialist or or a boulder specialist for that matter during the combined year when like nobody's paying attention to you. It's like you know you don't really matter this year. Sorry, it's it it's not a thing. But like we've said, the the men's podium from last year, Taisei, Jesse, and uh, Luca, you know, all of them had a comparatively bad year this year compared to last season. Uh, and so, yeah, I thought it was great to see Jesse back on the podium. And of course, for me, Alberto <laughs> was a huge one, too. Um, but yeah, I think that's fair, because I think if anybody just started watching lead climbing this season, Jesse Grouper might not be a name that was in your top like five male climbers, right? You'd be looking at Toby and Serato and Adam and Jakob again, who was kind of bailed last year and, and made the room for Taisei and Luca and, and Jesse and stuff. So yeah, I think it puts him back in the conversation. I haven't checked the math on the on the overall ranking. I still don't think he's in the running for top three for the year, but it was still good to see because again, like you've kind of mentioned, like US men's climbing this year has been a bit of a disappointment. Colin's incredible performance in uh, in Burn withstanding uh, the U.S. men kind of not a great season for them. So anything they can get, even if it's at the end of the year, is is probably pretty valuable. Yeah, and let's also mention that a lot of the, the biggest names or whatever you want to call them, uh, the the superstars, for lack of a better word, on the men's the U.S. men's team weren't at this competition. Mm -hmm. So uh, I I think that you went into it kind of maybe not really expecting. The, or I should say maybe kind of expecting the U.S. to kind of continue the trend that they've had all season. And then Jesse ends up doing this. And it's it's not only it sort of saves Jesse's season in a way, but yeah, to your point, I think it saves the U.S. season a little bit. I think you still have to come away from this whole 2023 saying the U.S. men underperformed. Uh, and I, I don't know, you know, the reason maybe they were aiming to peak at the world championships and, and for most of them that, that didn't work out in the in the ideal way, but uh, you kind of come away from this saying like, okay, there's still some there's still some gas in the tank for the U.S. men, and um, I don't know what kind of roster they're going to send to to China, but um, it was good. It was a good. It was a really good medal uh, podium place for for American fans and particularly men, fans of the American men's division, who I think have been pretty pretty hungry for some good results. This season, like you said, sort of Colin Colin Duffy's uh, stellar results are are kind of the footnote in all that. I yeah. do. You, do you guys recall seeing the U.S. coaches there? In they in, haven't been there. I was gonna say because I I I heard from somebody that Jesse was actually traveling with I think with family, possibly with his sister. Yeah, or something with his like sister. That. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so, he was traveling with his sister, so, and there, there was just Zach, the physio. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it seems like this was not, you know, this was not part of the U.S. climbing calendar. This was maybe just a personal diversion, like, hey, you know, I'm going to be in Europe for pleasure anyway, so let me do a World Cup while I'm out there. Um, it does is, seem like... Is, 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 that a, is that a knock? On, sorry to interrupt, Tyler. Is that a knock on the U.S. team? That, that, <laughs> uh, okay, World Championships aside, let's, let's just talk World Cups. Uh, the best result for the men's squad this season, the U.S. men's squad, comes when the coaches are not there 
That's no, I'm not. No, that's not. <laughs> yeah, we can paint it that way if you want for the clicks. No, I'm asking. That can be, asking that can be the thumbnail. The, the real problem with USA Climbing is the coaches. They're no. all standing away. No, that's obviously not what I'm saying. No, I, I just thought it was curious because it did seem like USA Climbing has maybe ended their season, ended the World Cup season. They're going to focus on Pan Ams. And, and you know, like if, if the goal of, like most countries, the goal at this point is Olympic places, right? Um, so if particular athletes are chasing their own goals and they can find finance themselves or you know i don't i don't know if jesse um you know got funding for this i don't know how that works with usa climbing but i i just wanted to note that it did seem like this was his own personal excursion out to coper and i imagine if he goes to wujang it's probably personal as well i i don't expect usa climbing would be sending a team at this point i don't think that should be a priority for them um i would like it if they did i'd love to end the season with natalia and brooke and and all of them there but i kind of doubt it um yeah so i was just just mentioning that i had heard from somebody who 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 said that he was there on his own so uh yeah just changes it up uh, i uh, he was training um in the same gym as Yania like with the Roman before the competition mm -hmm. and he's like really hard worker. I, you know, like Roman say now just it's over because, you know, you have like competition in two days, just stop to those 50 move cycles here. He was like, I never saw something like that before. <laughs> it's super crazy how he could still cycling there and yeah. yeah. So, that's good um, to it was impressive yeah good for him yeah he's clearly got you know it's it's interesting to think that people maybe have goals and have a training plan that doesn't synchronize with all of the olympic events right but you know there are still people that that care about that stuff so yeah, yeah. no it's interesting um yeah uh and then the, the last thing i wanted to to bring up just about the comp uh in particular was talking about root setting and talking about height uh, and whether or not it was a bigger factor, uh, a smaller factor, um, if it was really just down to dynamism or if the root setters really nailed it. Um, so on the surface, the root setting was perfect. The scores were excellent. There was really good separation. There were some cruxes, but for the finals, it, like we mentioned, the last climber got to the top. Um, but there's always been a lot of noise about Imori, if something doesn't work out for Imori, some people are quick to quick to say maybe the root setters didn't take into account her height. Um, for those final moves, particularly on the on the women's final, I haven't heard anybody talking about height being a factor for those final moves, even though the second last move is a bit of a dead point, and then of course the final move is really quite dynamic. Um, what do you think? Do you, Vladik? I'm curious for you, who actually probably mm -hmm. gets more feedback from real life you're actually at the events and you're around professionals talking about competition climbing whereas john and i are stuck in the internet at among all the <laughs> comment sections and everybody arguing about this stuff um is the conversation around root setting and height uh as prominent in real life at the comps as it is online so it was um it was in bern it was but not not in copper. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear any any word, not at all. So yeah. Is is that something that is um, like? Do you do you find that that comes up frequently, or or you know, for for me specifically, I find I mostly get comments about height and root setting, specifically around Imori. Um, Al Yurakusa brought up something on his Instagram in the last couple days saying that he felt he was affected by a reachy move that was too tall for him. But I, I'm just curious from from your perspective, do you find there uh, that Imori is is acting as kind of a lightning rod for people discussing height because she is quite short? Or, or do you think that's something that comes up just as frequently with climbers like Brooke or so on, like just in your own memory? Yeah, I think so. That that's that's the way. Like, if you have some smaller climber and they cannot, they cannot climb it. That the people just say, "Ah, oh, that's because of the height." But you know, we, we see it by Brooke many times. She could find her way. You know, like even like um, in the bouldering ground. First, you you think she had no chance, and then she will find her way up. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I. Yeah, and I was gonna say they're not all that different in height too. It's not like we're talking about with like like with Yanya. She's we're not talking about somebody that's 
in in you know <laughs> American measurement. She's not like five nine, five ten. She's like five five, right? Which is probably pretty average for the the women on the circuit. And I Mori, I think is like five foot one ish, um, which is shorter than Yanya, but it's it's not. I don't think I Mori's like the shortest person on the circuit by any means. Uh, I think maybe Brooke Brooke might even be shorter than her. So. Um, my sense is some of that sometimes does get overblown to Vladik's point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So at this point, I'm curious if you guys have anything particular from the comps that you guys wanted to talk about any notes about particular athletes, John, you're usually the guy that comes with notes, but if not, uh, there's still plenty we can talk about. So anything specifically what? comp related? Well, I just want to say that the I think the production value was surprisingly good too in this. Okay. Uh, uh, you know, I I think uh, they had some nice on-screen graphics and they also let's give a shout out to that like doorway of lights that people that the competitors walked through when they like the the sort of strobe light uh it looked like they were coming out of like a circus tent or something. It was all the <laughs> all the bright lights. It was really cool and I think that that just adds to what we said at the top of this show, which was that I, this, this competition was kind of a lot better, a lot more enjoyable than we expected it to be or that it had any right to be, not only from the competitors that showed up. I think it was a more robust roster than we would have expected with people like Yanya, Imori, Jesse Pills still there, still on the roster. Uh, then the results were really exciting, right? There were good separation, good route setting, and the production value was good. They had so. a smoke machine, you know? Now we're now we're talking. You give me a smoke machine, I'm happy. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny. Like it's it's I like when it's people are like trying to add some showmanship, but it still comes off as like slightly unprofessional. Like it's not quite perfect, but it's like they're still trying. Yeah, I thought it was kind of cute. Yeah. Um yeah, but before uh uh I, John's got a John wants to do a review segment, not not of the hugs. Everybody's always asking for hug <laughs> analysis now, like after every single competition. And we're going to have to make that, you know, a, a less frequent feature just so it doesn't burn itself out. Uh, John, you can just start your own, start your own blog, start, start, uh, start your own video series of just hug analysis and it would blow up, I'm sure. Um, comphugs.com. Comphugs.com. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> past hugs, past hugs on, on Spotify. Yeah. yeah. Um, but no, I, you know, having the opportunity to have somebody here that's actually traveling through the comp. So we're getting towards the end of the season. And I just kind of wanted to get some of Vladik's reflections on the circuit this year, on the stops that we've had, because we've had some, uh, some newer, uh, competition hosts in the last couple of years, like Brixen and Prague on the circuit this year, Coper, uh, coming over, uh, now that Kron is kind of out of the picture. And I just kind of wanted to, to ask you what you find are kind of the highlight, uh, world cups now, now that you've had a chance to kind of get a sense of these cities, do you have any particular favorites at this point there's of course long-standing hosts uh like chamonix of course and all that but are are some of these new venues and these these new stops uh matching those events or possibly even better in terms of your experience um like as a photographer for me it's probably at the moment the best venue brixen hmm. because yeah because the possibility to photograph like from a bit above because the venue is lower down then so, so you don't stand underneath and you know shoot up and um yeah the, the access to the wall it's kind of non-problematic which is harder and harder on the circuit you know mm. like there are so many restrictions yeah, so for sure the bricks, and I think it's my favorite one for the photography and yeah, uh, lead uh, Chamonix. Yeah, because of the backdrop and yeah, the atmosphere. So, yeah. yeah, well, you've you've got pretty basic needs as a photographer. You just need yeah. angles, <laughs> good Wi-Fi, and coffee, right? Those are the only <laughs> three things you need. Yeah. So let me let me ask them like, if you were just to suggest to somebody if they were saying, "Hey, I'm going to come to Europe for a World mm -hmm. Cup this year. Which World Cup should I go to? Whether it's bouldering or lead, like, what do you think is is the ultimate experience that people should get? I feel like Chamonix is probably the easy answer. So if that yeah. if that is your answer, what's what would you say is your like second choice after Chamonix? Uh, second choice, hmm, good question. Uh, let's say, I think the copper was pretty good, yeah. Mm. Yeah, I think the experience 
not just the World Cup, but the all things around, you know, like um, visiting the Slovenia because all people are really friendly and nice there and you get good food and it's easy to travel there. So, yeah, so the copper, yeah, I would say copper. Okay. My, my next question is, is a little bit more serious. Um, on online, there is so much talk about uh, red S and, and weight and uh, mm -hmm. eating and energy deficiency and all that stuff among athletes. Um, when you're an observer just on the internet, there are some people who talk about it a lot and there are some people who do not talk about it at all. Um, and unfortunately, there's, you know, rarely direct communication from the Athletes Commission or from the IFSC or the Medical Commission. It's pretty infrequent. Um, what are those conversations like when you're actually at the competitions? Um, is that something where you find there is constant discussion? Do you find, you know, we, we saw that there was mm -hmm. a minor protest in Bern, I think among the, yeah. the, I think that was just spectators. I don't think that was athletes um, or at least not World Cup athletes. I don't think like, what's it, what's there it like? Some the athletes. Right. Yes. There have been some athletes, yeah. No athletes um, have like boycotted or anything. They haven't like, they haven't actually stopped themselves from competing to protest. Yeah, though, right? no, yeah. No, I think there is like big discussion or it's a big team because everyone knows about it, you know, mm. and the problem is this ISFC didn't speak openly about this problem. You know, that there is no like, there is no, it's not about to blaming somebody. It's about to just, you know, say we have this problem and maybe we don't have like the ideal uh, um we don't we don't know like perfectly what to do with it but we can discuss about it you know but not say not like saying everything is perfect and we don't have this problem i think that's more more the thing because there is no communication but everybody knows that that's like every athlete yeah you can you can ask any athlete and they would tell you probably the same so that's a big thing yeah mm -hmm. do you do you get the sense that after so much discussion about it this year that uh do you do you have any faith that any actual actions are going to be taken um before the start of next season or do you think that that's unlikely do you think it's just going to be press releases and and you know promising to study something and you know not not any real action not any real framework or anything like that like where do you think it's actually going to come out over the next year I hope and I believe it will change something because, um, you know, I can still trust the ISFC. They, they, they do it for the athletes and they, they will have a healthy athletes on the circuit and it's all about healthy sports. So I cannot imagine like no action. So really, I cannot imagine that. So, hmm. yeah. John, I'll, so, uh, if you have any questions, I'm going to make room for you in a second, John. But I, I have one last question, which is about mm -hmm. uh, the Climbing Intelligence Agency, the podcast that you do with Bjorn Pohl. Mm -hmm. um, tell me, like, tell me uh, how the two of you guys decided to do something like that. Like, obviously, you're both photographers. I know Bjorn had a had a big blog back in the day, and of course, you're both involved yeah. in just media, marketing, climbing. Um, so, what? Uh, so, how did how did you guys kind of get involved with each other, and and why did you decide to to do these interviews? Yeah, I, I I remember I met Bjorn somewhere like many years ago in, I remember him, you know, standing there with his like small camera and like big guy with small camera taking yeah. the pictures. And then, <laughs> yeah, we start to talk and then, yeah, in the years we become the friends and we start traveling together actually on the World Cups and yeah, did some other things together. And then we say like, we know so much, so many athletes, like personally, and we know so much background information. It would be cool if we can share it with the other people because we think they are people who are, who are you know, they want more information. They, mm. you know, like it's all about the climbing, and we want to know more. And we didn't find any like really longer interviews, you know, than like five minutes and stuff. So we say, okay. Let's do it. So let's let's try it, and then with with no pressure, just because yeah, it's a fun. So yeah. What um, I, I I'm sure you, like you've interviewed a bunch of these athletes who you've actually mm -hmm. known for quite a long time before, um, yeah. and I know sometimes when you interview people, the interview doesn't fully reflect 
who you know them to be, right? They don't, they aren't completely themselves. They keep a little bit, maybe, maybe they don't answer some questions completely, or maybe they don't give their entire personality mm -hmm. to you. Who would you say are the, the athletes who the interview they did for you was like the closest thing to, to their actual personality? Who do you think was like the most open and, um, honest, I guess, about who they are. Like if you watch one climbing intelligence agency video, which one do you think is the best actual reflection of, of one of those climbers? I think it will be Adam probably. He okay. was like really, he's always, so I know him many years and he's always open to talk about anything, uh, everything. And he's, I think he's really honest there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think generally all the people are really honest hmm. kind of. We didn't ask so much, you know, some questions which could be like difficult to answer. Sure. But but I think they didn't it, it wasn't like uh, you know, PR for them, you know. So they right. really it was just relaxed interviews. So yeah. Yeah. I, I like this way. I like it this way. So, yeah. The the interviews you guys are, do are, are actually really, really good. And you can tell that there is like a, a connection between the, the climbers and you guys. Um, so yeah, I, I hope okay. you like, I, I hope you guys do as many of those as you can. Um, I pl like, I plan on doing climber interviews too, but the one thing I don't have is a history with the climbers. And so when I interview these people, I'm asking them to trust me and, and, you know, and, <laughs> and kind of try to be friendly with me, even though we've never met before. And, and so that's something that when, when you watch your interviews, it's actually really great content because it is so like honest and direct and it feels like the climbers are actually very comfortable. So yeah, I hope you keep doing a lot of them. Um, For sure. <laughs> yeah. John, yeah, the thing, the thing that I want to say that I like about your interviews, I mean, I, I would imagine most people watching the debrief here know about your, your channel and, and know about the Climbing Intelligence Agency. If they don't, though, they should absolutely go watch them because one of the things that I love is that you actually ask the athletes a lot about comp climbing. And we because we've seen before where a lot of these comp climbers go on to podcasts or whatever, like Adam or something like that, right? And or Jakob, for that matter. And you get like really excited and, and yet you start listening and you're like, well, all these questions are about their outdoor accomplishments or their outdoor sins. And it's like, I want to I want to know about their the comp stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I'm not knocking those podcasts. I understand. But that how can you how can you talk to Adam Andre for an hour and a half? And like none of it is about his competition history. That's like <laughs> baffling to me. Like that's that's the only thing I want. And then I get nothing. It's, it's a, uh, yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. And so that's. I think we're, yeah, Tyler, you and I are in agreement. Like I, I listen to all the, anytime a comp climber appears on a podcast, I, I try to listen to it, but so, so, so often I, I, it's just a couple minutes into it and I kind of get the tone and I'm thinking like, okay, this is all going to be outdoor stuff. And so I love that you and Bjorn keep the focus on what everybody watching this channel loves, which is, which is comp climbing. It's great. Yeah. And of course you do both, but I appreciate that, yeah. you right. know, it's not, Talk about your project and then tell us what your like finger training routine is like those that when it's just that stuff, I'm done. So I really appreciate you guys have the balance balance between everything. Um, Thank you. Yeah, uh, let's uh, let's wrap up. Um, John, I, I want to bring up the the slideshow that you have and I'd like you to preface it uh, however you want to introduce it and, and we'll go from there. OK, well, I'm really excited because we actually have a photographer here, Vladik, so he can give us some insight is it, from a, a, almost like a staging perspective of who who is the best here. So what people that were watching the live stream were treated to very brief privilege, athlete, privilege to see athlete profile videos. They just lasted about two seconds. And I assume the, the videographer said, OK, give me some sort of like do something with your hands. And and so the, the athletes would would do something, whether as we'll see, like a thumbs up or there were a lot of other uh, choices that people made in terms of what they would do on these profile uh, video clips. This is for the finalists in the men's and women's division, except uh, I don't think uh, Nanoha Kume had yeah, one. They I think didn't. they forgot. They, they didn't show hers if they had one. Yeah. She that will forever live in mystery. Maybe uh, she <laughs> maybe she's really hardcore and she was like, no, I'm a serious athlete. I don't do that <laughs> stuff. Yeah, that's but. the that's the archives to be released decades later. It will be yeah. Nanoha Kume's uh, Coper video profile. But yeah. uh, but everybody else, all the finalists got a little profile pic. So I thought I screen grabbed them and I thought we would analyze and we would each select which men and which woman 
had the be- made the best choice, chose to do the best, uh, I don't know, gesticulation, the best thing with their hands. And, and so, Vladek, I'm very curious to get your photographer insight about which one <laughs> stands out the most to you. So, and also and rest, in, home- rest in peace to everybody in Europe because this video is going to be instantly blocked from anyone. In Europe. <laughs> They're gonna, it's going to be geo blocked because this is this is Eurosport specific content. Um, so starting so, now, okay. Do you want to start with men's or women's? <laughs> either one, but we'll run through it. Tyler, if you just want to click through them, we'll say yeah. who the competitor is and we can show. Okay, so we'll start with the women's. This was Mia Crample chooses to give a heart. Pretty uh, standard choice of, of what to do. Uh, let's go to the next slide here. And remember who's doing what here. So this was Laura Regora. Uh, she, she kissed the bicep, which... Pretty great uh, in terms of like out of the box, uh, uh, something to do here. So yeah, she, but it's she like it's mostly out of the box because like if we have to rate all the athletes by the amount of biceps they have, like Laura is <laughs> definitely right at the bottom. But yes, I'll bring I'll bring it back up. Yeah. Okay, so Laura Gore kisses the biceps. Let's go to the next competitor. Uh, Vita Lukin gives the the a, a variation on the heart rather than the heart with both hands. She does the the small hearts with each. Uh, thumb and index finger clever variation <laughs> okay we get the wave so so uh, natsuki here chooses to wave we got a lot of waves and so i don't know vladik how you'll feel about things like waves and thumbs up which probably not the most creative choice for, but and for somebody like natsuki with the most creative beta on the circuit sometimes when with a really conservative choice on on this one so very conservative but but time honored you know a wave somebody in the in the 18th or 19th century would easily <laughs> identify what a wave is just like somebody now would so classic okay cheon goes with the fist pump the double the double fist bump there okay so i mori <laughs> chooses to do some product placement here. Now, I, I wish, I don't know what these these toys are that she's holding up or, or what, I don't know if they're toys or they're candy or I'm not sure. I don't think they have any sponsor ties to her, <laughs> but I was thinking that would be really cool if they did, if she was touting her sponsor here, if she's sponsored by some sort of toy company. Maybe somebody in the comments can can chime in with, I don't know. Is that Tyler? Is that Pokemon there or something? You, you know that you know sure. that thing where if if something is super super cute, you want to crush it. It's like this human response <laughs> where you just want to destroy things that are too cute. I feel like Imori, who is already like the most like. The, just like seems the most like a child like she looks very very young now with this this is getting to the point where it's like i'm the like anger is rising inside inside <laughs> well, of my brain it's completely irrational but well what but, would yeah. be really nice if she's holding this up and then she's like oh and by the way for 5.99 you can buy these from my website <laughs> or like that. but i don't think that's the case but anyway so that's what we get from imori and then yanya gives the double thumbs up uh another time-honored Time honored signal. I think is that all of them? That's it. That yeah, that was That's that was it. in order. So my question to all of you, to, to both of you, I should say, Tyler and Vladik, which is your favorite? Which was the most the, the best selection, the most creative selection? Who do you got here? Uh it's easy. I'm Mori for sure. <laughs> I'm Mori. Let me let me skip forward. Let's let's break this one down. So do we, first of all, do we think she owns these toys? Are these hers or are they somebody else's? Is this, does she carry these in her like ISO bag? Yeah, I, I th- I'm guessing maybe like good luck charms or something like that. Yeah, I think brought from Japan, presumably. Yeah, maybe some candies. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe candy. I would think honorable mention has got to go to Lara Regora for the flex and the bicep, the <laughs> kissing the biceps. Um, that's definitely the best laugh. That is, that is, there's like endless irony in this one. My winner, I think, is Mia Crample. She is saying, everybody, I love you, but it's my time to go now. I'm about to absolutely flub this route. And Aww. so this is, this is it <laughs> for me. I love you. It's over. Um, remember me. So yeah, that's, that's, I think, my favorite is Mia Crample wishing us all well before she completely disappears from the wall in a, in a, uh, and a foot slip of glory, a giant rubber mark down the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So we'll give it to, uh, we'll give that one to I, Maury. Uh, honorable mention, Laura Regora. Let's go to the men here. Okay. So we actually didn't really talk about Alberto's performance that much, but he had a great, uh, he had his 
I, I just, Alberto for perfect. life. He'll be back. The Olympics was a fluke, but he's still awesome. I love that guy. Whatever. Moving on. Best, uh, but can best I just say this is this yeah. is definitely the worst screen grab you sent me. This is the blurriest <laughs> possible. Well, Vladik will appreciate this. He he. Uh, the, Alberto was in motion the whole time. He didn't hold still, so it was very hard to screen grab him with any sort of clarity. <laughs> but uh, he's doing the the single fist pump there. Good choice, and he's got the Red Bull. Uh, merch there, advertising. Next, a climber. Okay, uh, so, okay, uh, Luca Potichar here brushes off the shoulders, which we didn't see from the women. Pretty classic choice here. I like it. Uh, brush off the, the shoulder. Good stuff. It's throwback Next. to all that Slovenian hip hop, you know, West Side, East sure. Coast, you know, all that sure. stuff. Famous, <laughs> famous over there in Slovenia. So Sam and <laughs> Vladik, you are seeing all these for the first time since you were there. Yes, in yes. So, Sam Avazu chose to do, I don't know what you would call this. I have not seen this since grade school, probably first grade or something, but he, he chooses to put the goggles on. I don't really know why he chose to do this. Some sort of s subliminal message. Is this, I, is this the thing where if you do that and somebody looks at you, you get to like, punch them or something like i don't remember i remember this from <laughs> school but i don't remember what the joke was like uh, yeah i i'm not sure i like it that he's kind of throwing it back to first grades pri you know yeah. primary school here yeah. and, uh, um it's a good yeah. look it's a good, good look, look from sam avazu and it's a subtle was... way to show off the biceps without drawing attention to yourself like this is a humble way to show off how jacked you are shows off his flexibility too that's pretty hard on the wrists <laughs> to do that i think Okay, so Alex Magos here shows us some blue steel, some Derek Zoolander, uh, uh, like a, kind of showing his modeling chops here, I guess. Very uh, 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 staring down the camera. Vladik, from a photographer's standpoint, <laughs> how do you feel about Magos' modeling pose here? That's perfect. Perfect. That's perfect German pose. There we go. <laughs> okay, so Yannick... This was interesting. He w had his back to the camera and then he turned and he folded his arm kind of swiftly, a, d a dynamic fold of the arms. Uh, good choice. I, I didn't expect that. Also a little bit of modeling flair. This was very like Mortal Kombat to me, right? This is like character <laughs> select and they just, you know, like that kind of thing. Or I guess that's almost like a U.S. sitcom you know, introducing the cast of a really bad comedy and the entire starring, family, you know, yeah. s starring whoever, Bob Saget, rest in peace, doing the old like, oh, I didn't see you there. S yeah. Like starring Yannick thing, Floe. You know? Yeah. I, I would certainly watch a sitcom with y y Yannick Floe and, and Alex Magos, you know, living in a, a German house together. Sign <laughs> me up. Jesse Grouper. So Jesse Grouper kind of clapped his hands and then blew the chalk off. And which was what was really interesting is you could see he has chalk on his fingers here. So this was not just something campy done for the camera. He actually did. It was certainly that. It was certainly it a was boom certainly of good. chalk. Good stuff from Jesse. Yeah, good prop and comedy. I don't know if we have anybody. Who do we have left? Oh, we have. That's right. We have two left. So uh, Toby Roberts here points at the camera. What was interesting is how similar his was to the last person, Serato, who get a, a little more uh, joyful in his facial expression for pointing at the camera than Toby was. But the, similar choices from Toby and Serato. So those are the choices for the men. Vladik, Tyler, who's your favorite? I think I would go for Serato. Serato, really? Hmm. Yeah, because... Did you did you did you see his last post on the Instagram when he say my emotions explode or something like that and yeah. and the story after like there was a story when he's like very stone faced you know? yeah. yeah right I was like okay <laughs> Japanese way of <laughs> yeah a good way of expressing yourself is just being yeah. completely emotionless yeah um yeah I I think this one is good Alex definitely wins for like he could have a career in modeling but I think like Toby Toby has learned from the American action movie school of of shooting which is you have to turn the gun sideways to <laughs> 
look coolest. Cool. It, it ruins yeah. your accuracy, and you're going to spend the entire magazine shooting down that alley at the running criminal and not hit him once. But this is how you look cool for the for the action movie. Well, it, um, the, the he, he does look expression. They, you're right. The facial expression is crap. He needs to look a little bit more invested in this. He looks uh he looks a little sad, a little. It, it, it looks like you were trying to play a joke on Toby and he kind of caught you and, and was mm-hmm. saying like, come on, you yeah, know, like he's, something like he's that. sort of catching. I don't know. Um, I, I like Serato's too. I'd give it to him. I don't know. Sam Abzu, sort of the wild card there with the, the bug eye goggles. Huge. Thing. Yeah. 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 This, but of course now does any of this compare to the classic Mejdi Shalk belly roll from Brianson 2020? <laughs> 2019. I don't have it ready to queue up, unfortunately, although I have copies of it on every computer I own, just in case I need a, a gif of Mejdi doing that belly roll, but I just don't have it right now. So sad that I can't pull it up. Just Google it. It's in the Discord if you need it. But uh, but anyway, I still think yeah. that is the king introduction, just lifting up your shirt and then doing a weird thing with your with your abs. That was I would the, agree. the greatest ever. I would agree. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank Good you, John. Stuff. I appreciate you. I appreciate you putting that together for us. Hey, I bring the heart journalism here with this yeah um i we'll just do closing thoughts on this um of course i think we all agree that it was a really good competition um but i just want to if you have any last particular points or shout outs um i think the the did i have one my oh mine was actually alberto we didn't get a chance to talk about it but from leading in qualifiers topping both routes semifinals was a little bit of a squeaker but then this beautiful arc at the end where it almost looked like he was in the running for a gold medal for a second you know he he gets a fairly low he's the first one out gets to like i can't remember what the score was but you're like well that's not going to be enough but then the next four people after him or whatever (laughs) fall even lower and you're like no no way is this about to happen no it's not possible and of course it doesn't quite hold up but he still gets the podium his first time on the podium since like what 2020 2019 possibly yeah, I think since 2019. So huge, huge deal for him. So glad he's back on the podium because I think he's like a genuinely exciting climber. I like him as a character. And I do think competition climbing is better when climbers from Spain are actually here. That country's been so important to competition climbing. So for them to have somebody to actually cheer on somebody who's a great climber and has his own style, like I'm I'm just in love with it. So I really hope this gives him a little bit of, of satisfaction because I'm sure it's been a hard couple of years for him after all of that pressure from the Olympics and what a what a like a, a mess that must make your head um, winning the Olympics and becoming the most famous speed climber in the world. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm glad he got some success on the lead wall again. So uh, that's my my shout out to end it. Um, John, what about you? Yeah, good stuff from Alberto. I'll second that. This was his best result. Well, in addition to the Olympic pressure, he's been dealing with some injuries, too. And so to have him come back, his best result since, I think, like mid-June, that seemed to be where he did really well. He had a, an eighth place, I believe, in, in the, the bouldering in Brixen. And then, and then sh- like, the, the following week or, you know, the, the shortly thereafter, I think he had an eighth place when the lead season started in Innsbruck. So he was kind of you know, eighth and ninth sort of struggling to even make finals there or kind of right on the bubble, right on the cusp of finals. So this result here at Coper far exceeds that this mm-hmm. season in terms of his mm-hmm. best results this season seems to be back in and fully, you know, fully healthy again and suddenly puts himself kind of in the mix for maybe another Olympic spot. Right. I mean, we kind of forgot about him. <laughs> now, now we might be overreaching, but yeah, it, maybe, it might, maybe, maybe, but yes. It, it almost seems like if he was planning to peak at this season at the World Championships, presumably, right, to qualify for the Olympics, it's like, well, maybe he came really, really close. Maybe he just missed that by, like, two weeks, and maybe he's now hitting his performative peak. And if he, if he can continue that, it'll be great. It'll be really exciting if he can uh, have a, a viable shot for another Olympics. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, Vladik, do you have any final shout-outs or any last elements of the comp you wanted to mention? Um, yeah, again, I would uh, say, like, the... Final routes, they have been perfect, like in terms of resu- results. That's, uh, I, I just love like two tops, it's perfect. Mm-hmm. And yeah good separation and it's so rare the, like people the, um, people yeah. need to value this like this isn't yes. going to happen again for probably quite a while um there's nothing you can do about it. you can have the best root setters in the world and you still aren't going to get this at very many comps so savor it yeah. while we have it yeah 100 exactly. 
All right, guys, thank you very much for watching another episode of The Debrief. Of course, you can like and comment and subscribe down below. You can support us on Patreon. And of course, you can check out the work that John and Vladik both do in the description down below. And of course, there's one last World Cup of the season left, but there's still more climbing. We've got, I think, just... This coming weekend is the European Speed Olympic Qualifier. We've got all the Continentals. We've got the OQS. This season's never going to frickin' end, but there's only one World Cup left, and that will wrap up, actually, for us five years of doing this, John. Five years of the debrief in just wow. two weeks. So, uh, yeah, make sure you join us for that one. So enjoy the competitions, and until we see you, uh, just enjoy that climbing, all right? See you in the next one.